DiscerningHearts.com presents Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections, with Monsignor John Essif. Monsignor Essif is a priest in the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He has served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. He continues to offer direction and retreats for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Monsignor Essif encountered St. Padre Pio, who would become a spiritual father to him. He has lived in areas around the world, serving in the Pontifical Missions, a Catholic organization established by St. Pope John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially to the poor. He continues to serve as a retreat leader and director to bishops, priests, sisters, seminarians, and other religious leaders. Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Good morning. Good morning, Monsignor. How are you today? Very good. Very good. Thank you. The Feast of St. Padre Pio. What a great feast, huh? I can't even uh, imagine what it must be like for you to have known those individuals who have been lifted up and are now saints. Does that make you a second-class relic? (laughs) I, uh, I feel very privileged to have known them, to have met them to have been accompanied by him. And I believe all of us have various saints that we're just really looking forward to, to spending time with, or eternity. And what would a visit be like with your favorite saints? Hagiography, which is the study of the saints, I really think needs a review, because so often we think that we almost make them unreal. St. Pio suffered terribly in many, many ways. Yes, he is honored and praised now, but he was rejected, just like Jesus. What was his stigmata a sign of? The suffering of Jesus Christ. When I heard of him, I was very drawn to go to see him. And when I went to see him, the time that I saw him, He was banished to the furthest monastery that the Franciscan had. There he was, way off. Petriol Sina is not the the center of the world. It's the furthest monastery they had. It's way up in the hills on the Adriatic side of Italy. Not the center, certainly, of Franciscan life. And I think they were trying to hide him. Because, why? Because the bishop suspected that his, and I didn't know this at the time, that his wounds were self-inflicted, that he was self-inducing the wounds. And his bishop was convinced that he had to be silenced, and he did. He was unable to preach. What kind of psychological, emotional, as well as physical pain does a priest have? when he's been banished to a far remote place, silenced, unable to preach, the only thing he could do was hear confessions. And what a magnificent, he did, completely obedient. What example does he really give us? When Jesus was lied about, when he he was subjected to all kinds of examination and tests, even the place that they sent him to, said that they weren't sure that his wounds were not self-imposed. Isn't that amazing that somehow or other the, the test didn't come out to clearly exonerate him, which he completely was, was suffering from in, in every way. And so when I, when I met him, you know, I, he asked me, are you a curiosity seeker? That was the first thing he said to me. I was having... Uh, dinner and at supper at Mary Pyle's house. His nephew was there, another priest and myself. And when he came, I thought that he was just visiting there. I, he was talking to him. He was talking to me. And Mary Pyle said this he was bi-locating. He had so many gifts. Padre Pio had such gifts in the confessional. He had the gift of... He hardly ate. 
He maintained his weight. His fasting was not just fasting. His food was mainly the Eucharist. He maintained his bodily weight and every day bleeding from the wounds, these magnificent gifts of bilocation, the stigmata, the insights he had of reading souls in the confessional. So when I when I met him, I was convinced and brash as I remember myself being as I looked at that first encounter with him, that I said to him, I don't have the stigmata, but every time I offer Mass, I have in me Jesus, the same Jesus that's in you. And I don't understand why you have to have those wounds. If that makes me a curiosity seeker, then that's what I am. But I've never quite understood the stigmata. That was before I went to his mass. And I know he and God forgives me for being so arrogant with this holy man. The next day when I participated in the mass, which he offered at the monastery, it was such a a life-changing experience for me to be with St. Pio, Padre Pio, at his Mass that May Day in 1959 as the blood came streaming down his hands at the Eucharistic celebration. As I walked near the altar where he had offered Mass, seeing the blood stains on the ground, and watching these women that I saw who were at the Mass dabbing the blood with cotton, having a, a relic of a saint, which I'm sure they kept even till today. There, there were hundreds of people at that Mass and at, at, at his daily Mass. But I, I, what I probably most remember is the ecstatic love as he elevated the host, seeing, entering into, participating in the, the suffering and the dying and the rising of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. The ecstatic union that he would have in elevating the cup, the chalice, the three hours, that, that was about the, the time I was there with that Mass. But it was an unforgettable experience of a man completely absorbed by God. But that life that he was leading, which God had asked him to lead, first the physical pain, when they would ask him, you know, he, he would just, his walking. How would you like to have holes in your feet all the time? He said, they're not ornaments. Holes in your hands. Before the Mass, that I, that he came over to me before the Mass the next day, when I, after I uh, supper with him, and then when he came over to me, the first time he came to me, he was looking at me. I know that he had the power of reading souls because he was looking right down into me. And I thought, what is he seeing in me? What a grace-filled moment that was as he was there. And the other priest, it was I thought it was an hour. He said it was about 20 minutes just looking at me. Then he went over and he made his Thanksgiving or preparation for Mass. And he came back to me. This was before Mass. And he took off a glove. He always wore a glove that covered the wound. And as I looked at his hand, I could see light shining through. It was like a huge blood blister on his hand. That's all there was. And I could see light through the wound. And he blessed me that day. And I have felt so blessed by him. 
he also assured me that he would be helping me for the rest of my life, anytime I would ask him, if I would send my angel to him, he would assist me in my work in the sacrament of confession. Beside the centrality in my years of priesthood, the work of being a, a spiritual director and a confessor, and many times you're faced with difficulties in the sacrament, people who come, what to say, what to do, what and what is necessary to heal, to bless, to guide this particular soul, I would immediately send my angel to him. And he has been such an aid, such a guide, and such an assistant for me in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. St. Pio has had this magnificent effect on the whole world. One of the most popular saints that was canonized, there were many, many saints, Mother Teresa, and all, there were many of, this, of our day. There was no more popular. Why? Because he touches souls, souls, souls. What does a saint do? He reaches out. He radiates. And that's the lampstand. That's what, who is the light that's in him? Jesus. Who does he radiate? Those wounds. You, you just don't radiate through the wounds. You radiate through love. No one who lights a lamp conceals it or puts it under a bed. Rather, he places it on a lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not become revealed. They tried to silence him. They tried to put him in the most remote part of the world. No, he would not be hidden. Doesn't this give such hope to all of us? When you are hidden, when you are rejected, when you are sometimes told that you're not the real deal, God knows. God knows who you are. St. Pio is a powerful example to us of obedience, of silence, of humility, of acceptance. Anything that is true, that is in you, that is united with God's love. The church needs to be rebuilt. Can you think of any darker times for the church today in the United States, in the world? The house of God is going to be rebuilt. The church has not come to its end. God will use each one of us that you are this sign in the world today. My brother priests, bishops, Christians, people, no matter what seems to be the brokenness of the body, the rejection, the, the abandonment, the alienation, the banishing, no. He threw Padre Pio and the sign of his life the conquest of truth over lies, love over hatred, obedience over all, to do the will of God and to prevail. And so I, I, was, I was hoping that what I could do today with you is to pray again on his feast, the magnificent prayers that he had given us to pray, and that we could pray them with him, that each one of us, he prayed these when he was on earth. Listen to his words and make them part of your resolution to be a lamp on a lampstand, to be a light radiating out into the world. How do you do this? 
remain connected with Jesus. Remain connected through Jesus with the Father. That the Holy Spirit will unite you through these prayers. That Mary, right here, will be with us today. St. Pio, hear these prayers. Pray with us. St. Pio, intercede with our Lord today for the rebuilding of the Church of God, the temple. And as now, we continue to pray. Padre Pio, help each of us, every one of us. Stay with me, Lord, for it is necessary to have you present so that I do not forget you. You know how easily I abandon you. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my life, and without you I am without fervor. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my light, and without you I am in darkness. Stay with me, Lord, to show me your will. Stay with me, Lord, so that I hear your voice and follow you. Stay with me, Lord, for I desire to love you very much and always to be in your company. Stay with me, Lord, if you wish me to be faithful to you. Stay with me, Lord, as poor as I am, I love you very much. And I want to be a consolation to you, a nest of love. Stay with me, Jesus, for it is getting late. And the day is coming to a close. And life passes. Death, judgment, eternity approaches. It is necessary to renew my strength so that I will not stop along the way. And for that, I need you. It is getting late and death approaches. I fear the darkness, the temptation, the dryness, the cross, the sorrow. Oh, how I need you, my Jesus, in this night of exile. Stay with me tonight, Jesus. In life, with all its dangers, I need you. Let me recognize you as your disciples did at the breaking of the bread, so that the Eucharistic communion be the light which disperses the darkness, the force which sustains me, the unique joy of my heart. St. Pio, pray for us. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. We'll return to Building the Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Esser in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. 
You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Building the Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Esser. It really calls us to a complete surrender, doesn't it? Yes. I, I, I think so often we think the saints didn't have to go through that grinding crucible. Uh, but if you're, if you're going to be united with Jesus, what happened to him will happen to us. And and though we may for a time be honored and recognized in this world, every one of us, if I'm united with him, he is in me, then the world is going to come against us. And the world, if it, if it doesn't oppress us and reject us, there must be something that I'm compromising with the world. But when I do, when I find myself rejected and abandoned, and alone. That's when I can most turn to the Father and turn to the Holy Spirit for the strength and be united with him. That's when the Eucharist means so much. And it's after the suffering, because this is the promise that our Lord gave us. You cannot be my follower unless you take up your cross. And this saint who carried within his body the same wounds of our Lord carried also within his soul the same rejections and abandonment and suffering that our Lord had. Now he has the resurrection, the glory, and it will be forever. What a magnificent sign he is to us. Ultimately, see here with Padre Pio is eternal glory a hundred thousand years from now you see the holes in his hands the rejection the pain was in 1968 it ended god took him to his glory and now we have saint pio and isn't it strange that what we still want to call him padre pio yeah. and that little abandoned way out place just like ours became a center for John Vianney Petrosina has become a center a byword here Jesus lived through St. Pio and Jesus will live where you are wherever you are when you are uniting your suffering your dying and your rising with him and all over the world today, the church is announcing the rebuilding of the church. The church will be rebuilt through you and with you and in you because you are in him and through him and with him. You will be of light also. For all eternity, you'll be on a lampstand. Monsignor, yes, there are those out there who may have experienced rejection because of the results of their own actions, because there were things that choices that were made that maybe in hindsight they 
there's a desire or wish that they hadn't done that, or they feel it's unforgivable. Padre Pio is still a exa- great example for all of us out there feel we're unforgivable. Padre Pio, in examining himself before the Father, was always examining himself right here in this prayer that I just told you. Mm-hmm. What, did, what was he saying to God? He was not free. Listen, stay with me, Lord, for it is necessary to have you present so that I do not forget you. You know how easily I abandon you. He could abandon Jesus at any time. Listen how weak he is. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my life, and without you I am without fervor. Do you think he had that for? He didn't. The dryness, the wretchedness that he tasted and experienced was if he was on his own. But what radiates through him was Jesus, not Padre Pio. Listen to him. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my life, and without you I am without fervor. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my light. Without you I am in darkness. I am without fervor. I am in darkness. Who, me? Stay with me, Lord, to show me your will. Without you, I do my own will. Who's doing it through him? So if I have made the choice to do my will, and Padre Pio saw what is going to preserve us all from that same fall is prayer. I love the story that I heard about St. Jerome and St. Augustine. St. Augustine had been terrible in his in his life. He had a paramour, he had illegitimate children. He eventually became a bishop. And when he became a bishop, there was a priest whose name we now know as St. Jerome. And he was also in the Syrian desert, and he probably never had an impure thought in his life. He was one of those perfect people. And after Augustine insisted that the certain books belonged in the in the canon of the Bible, and because he was a bishop, he was able to vote, and they voted on these these seven books belonging to Jerome, who didn't think he thought they shouldn't be there, was furious. And he wrote and told him that you used your power because you're the big bishop of Hippo, and here I am, just a simple priest out here in the Syrian desert. I know what I'm talking about, and you just use your power and your political persuasion. But I remember you when when you were messing around and and screwing around and when you had all those illegitimate children and when you were such a bad character, attacking the bishop. Augustine wrote very quietly in his response. He just gave all the reasons why he believed these books belonged in the canon. And then just one line in referring to to Jerome, which was so powerful, I have never forgotten. My dear brother Jerome, with tenderness, with love, the grace of God that forgave me is the same grace that preserved you. The grace of God that Padre Pio had is that same grace that you could have. If he was preserved when he was attacked, That same grace is yours. We're all open to grace. And we are all, without it, sinners. Padre Pio was saying to you and me, that's what I am. When he's telling Jesus, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, in this prayer on his feast day, he's saying, without you, I can do nothing. And that's true with all of us. So there are those of us who try to do it on our own. And I'm sure Padre Pio in his time, there is no one who is without sin except Mary. And that's the teaching of the church. And if there's anyone else, whether he be bishop or priest or whoever, whatever saint, 
every saint can can list that I am a sinner redeemed, I am a sinner sanctified, I am a sinner saved by Jesus Christ. God bless. You've been listening to Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif.